All right, so here we're going to take a look at a Hayward H-Series pool heater. This one specifically is an H-250. It's a millivolt system, which means that it requires no external power or power supply or anything like that to get the gas flowing or to ignite it. So what happens is you light the pilot light, and the pilot light burns up against uh, two things. One is called a thermal pile, which is what generates a small amount of electricity to power the valves and open them and close them. And then the other one is a thermal couple, which uh, lets the gas flow to the pilot light. So you can imagine you have your little pilot light here, and it burns up against the thermal pile and the thermal couple. The thermal couple is what, uh, is what controls the pilot light itself, so if the pilot should go out, um, the thermal couple and the thermal pile aren't going to be generating power, so it's going to release that little spring in the gas valve that keeps the, the gas flowing and cut the flow of gas to the pilot light. Um, the thermal pile is what generates power, a small amount of power in millivolts DC to, uh, to hold those little springs open and the gas valve to let the flow to the burner. And that'll be, that'll be the same in any millivolt system. So whether you have a gas fireplace, um, a hot water tank, uh, any other kind of heater appliance that's a millivolt system, it generally works like that. So my video is going to be a little more specific to this type of pool heater. These older um, H-series, the H100, the H150, the 250, the 300, those types of things. Now, not all of them are like this. This is just the millivolt ones. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do is open your panel if you're having problems. Everything you need to access, you can access through this front panel. You don't have to worry about the sides. The sides you only get into if you're trying to take out, um, I don't know, any other components. Like, uh, I don't know, maybe on that side, the, the heat exchanger, or uh, you're trying to clean it out. Now, I recommend at the beginning of every season, you clean this thing out good because there's always going to be crud in there, especially if you leave it out, definitely cover it, I mean that's a must, especially if you, if you have snow in the winters, uh, cover it, but every year open it all up, vacuum it and clean it, because you don't want to be starting any fires or melting anything in there. Every year when I vacuum it out, there's, there's always crap in there. So to open it up, it's pretty straightforward. All you really got to do is loosen the screws here, they're not going to come all the way out, they're held in. And then this is going to remove your front panel over here, which is going to give you access to um, the, the gas burners down here, the actual valve itself, all the wiring and all that kind of stuff. Further up, very simple, all you have is your on-off switch and your thermostat over here. The purpose of the thermostat is to generally control um, when you want this thing to go off, when the water reaches a certain temperature. It's not exact, it's just very, um, very general, you know? But I mean, you're, you're gonna wanna have this thing running, you just put it on before you wanna swim, maybe um, half a day before, a couple hours before, depending on how warm the water is already and how warm you want it to get. So, if you're having problems getting your thing lit up, there's a couple steps you want to take. And you're basically going to start from the pilot light and work back. Now, these things are, they're not that complicated. But the general idea is that over here is where the wire goes down to the thermal pile. This is your uh, gas tube for the pilot light itself, which goes down and under. When the pilot light is burning, you can see it through this little hole over there. I'll try and put the camera in there after so you can see it. Um, you, there's not going to be fire over here where these little tubes are. That shoots the gas into the tube and the combustion happens way in there. So you're only going to see that under here. Now, the first thing you want to make sure is that the pilot light is lighting. So if the pilot light is lit, that's a good sign. Now, on this one over here, what you do is you turn this knob to pilot. You hold it down, and then you and you push the igniter. Mine lights in one shot, and I mean this thing. This thing's about 10, 12 years old, and it, it just fires up every single time. And it was actually sitting dead for about 10 years, complete non-use, and I only fired it up this year, 
and I got a chance to repair it and I single it up perfectly. So you're going to turn your knob to pilot, you line it up with this little notch over here, you hold it down and you push your igniter and you're going to want to hold it down for a good 30 seconds a minute just to let that, that gas come through um, and start generating some current in there. So once that's done and your pilot light is lit, you want to make sure that it's actually generating power. I'll show you how to do that. So now you're going to want to get yourself a multimeter, one that has a DC function. Um, this one over here, this is a Klein uh, MM200 specifically. So what I do is I turn it to the voltage reading setting and I press down the function and it changes it to DC. You'll see the numbers all waddling around, but as soon as you short out the probes, you should see that it'll drop right to zero. Just in case you didn't know, on some meters when you unscrew this part on the probe, it uh, elongates it so that you could stick it in an outlet or get a better uh, grip on whatever. And the purpose of this is so that if you're doing like microelectronics, it doesn't slide around you. Anyways, so now you're going to want to touch on these two terminals, the TH and the T or the TP or whatever it might be labeled. So we're going to touch right here and right here. Now you're going to see that we're getting a negative reading. That just means that we have them reversed. But the reading is going to be the same. So the first one is my negative and the second one is a positive. So now you can see we're getting about 475 millivolts-ish, which is pretty good. Now that means the thermal pile is generating power. That is good. Now, if that's all good and we're, you're still playing with the switches and nothing's happening, well, that means you have a problem with your switches or somewhere. Now, as you can see, there's quite a bit of corrosion and shit in here. And that just happens when you have something metal sitting outside on the weather. Now, what I did was I got a, a wire brush and these contacts here, I scraped them all down. You can see they're a little more shiny now, but they were probably about that color before. So I undid these contacts. I brushed everything down with a little bit of sandpaper and a wire brush, got all the shit off, and that fixed the contact issue. Now, my issue specifically was the contacts, my pressure switch, which I'll get into in a minute, and um, I think a wire was broken or something. So, basically what happens from this point on is the power is broken. Now, it's broken by the thermostat, the switch, the, uh, the limit switches, and the pressure switch. We have three limit switches. One is over here, the other one is just right here, and the other one is around the back where the water comes in. These two here are to prevent um, any kind of fire, so if there's heat coming down here, too much heat back here, there's this switch over here, there's, this, there's like a little piece of metal inside and it'll bend when it overheats and it'll open the circuit that won't let the current flow and it'll shut off the gas valve. Um, your other one, I believe, is connected to the thermostat um, and that's what shuts it off when it reaches a certain temperature. Um, I believe there's also another one wired right in that's connected directly to this so that if the water gets too hot because your thermostat failed or something, it'll, it'll shut it off. And the last one is the good old pressure switch and those are what normally fails. These were all fine for me. I actually only had to replace one up here. You can see it's nice and shiny because I broke it trying to get it out. So that's the only reason why I had to replace that. Now your pressure switch is hiding right up there. I'm gonna get one that I've already pulled out to give you a closer up look. So here's a pressure switch I pulled out of another heater. <clears throat> Basically is how it works is you have this tube over here. It's a copper tube and you have the coupling up here. So when water is flowing through the system, it pressurizes this little vessel, or whatever you want to call it over here, and that little piece of plastic pops right out, and it hits this switch right here, like that, which closes the circuit and lets the current flow through to the gas valve. Now, these little switches, they're not the greatest piece of technology. I have found so many of these fail in things from water coolers to these heaters to, I don't know, just everyday devices that have crapped out and it's because of this exact switch. 
Um, it's a very common switch. You'll find them in, in basically everything. Um, there's usually, there can be only two legs like this, or there can be another leg. Um, you can see it'll be in normal open or normal close. This one's set for normal close. So if there was another leg up there, it would be normal open. So as soon as I push the button, the little latch flies open. <coughs> Actually, yeah, normal open and then it closes. So, anyways, now to get to this part, which I'm going to hold it here because it's hard to get the camera in there. Um, but you can see that in there, it's to get this thing off, you got to unscrew it and just a whole bunch of shit and water's going to start pissing out of it. So. For me, what I found was easiest was I took my Dremel and I just grinded the rivets off because this whole thing is riveted. You can't unscrew it. So when you, when if the repairman or whatever is going to tell you that this has to be replaced, they're going to replace the whole fucking thing. Now, this switch costs about twenty cents to a dollar at an electronics store, and this is all you need. So a repair person could charge you up to a hundred dollars or more for this piece over here plus time, labor, and all that good shit. So, this switch, a buck, I just grinded the rivets off, and I screwed it with some uh, screws back on, and it works fine. Because there's nothing wrong with this, it's only the piece of crap switch that fails on you because it starts to corrode or whatever. And when you take one of these apart, you can see how thin and delicate the contacts are. And if you have a cheap one, the contacts aren't copper. In mine, the contacts were copper, and it still failed. So in here is where the pressure switch is. Now, like you can see, or maybe you can't see, I'll try and get some more light. Well, that's as good as it gets, but right here is where I put the screws to try and hold this thing on. You can see they're not screwed all the way because I just got enough to hold it. Um, over here, you'll see this is a shrink tubing that I put over because I actually had to cut off the connectors and replace them because they were so corroded. So in here is my pressure switch. You can bend that thing around a little bit. Um, just don't get too crazy, but it's, it's pretty flexible if you need to access it. So I replace the contacts, and um, it works fine now. Here's the switch. I actually replaced the switch itself. It was a black one. I put on this orange one. The thermostat, I don't think it works too great. I mean, like I said, I only turn it on before I'm going to swim. But... Um, now I'm going to tell you how to diagnose your switches. One thing I probably should have mentioned from the beginning, or whoops, or a little earlier in the video, is after you've figured out that this thing is generating current, to make sure that it actually works, you just want to jumper these two terminals. Um, and basically what that's going to do is um, falsely jump current across and let you know that the valve is working perfectly. So I'm going to do that right now. and. Um, I want you to listen over here. I'm going to see if I can get the mic close enough so that you can hear the thing light up. You're not going to see it because, like I said, the combustion is back there. And I don't want to stick the camera under there and uh, risk blowing it up. So I'm holding the microphone a bit closer and I set it to plus 20 to try and see if you can hear the uh, combustion. So as soon as I touch this, it's going to open the gas valve and it should light up. There it is. And as soon as I take this off, it will, uh, oops. And that sound right there is the sound of no water flowing through the system. So you don't want to do this if the pump is off, by the way, because uh, like I said, we're completely bypassing the uh, switch, the pressure, the pressure switch up here. So we don't want to be running this thing dry. So I kind of just forgot about that for the moment. But um, as you can see, jumping it works. So let that be a lesson to you. Do not fire this thing up if water is not flowing through the system because it's not exchanging the heat and uh, you risk a fire or melting something or doing not good stuff. So now that we've determined there's nothing wrong with the gas valve, we're going to check our switches. Now you're going to do this for the pressure switch and all of the other limit switches. You're going to take your multimeter and you're going to set it to the continuity setting. And basically what this does is when there's continuity, between the probes, it'll um, start beeping, depending on what kind of meter you have, and show the resistance. The resistance is not all that important unless you really want to get fancy and figure out how good the switch is, but as long as you get in contact between them, uh, it's good. So you're going to touch one end to one end of your switch, and the other end 
to the other. And you're going to press on the switch, and you can see that when I press it, we're getting contact, which means the switch is good. On my pressure switch, and you don't actually have to take the switch out to do this, you just pop off the connectors, you touch the probes, and you press the switch. Um, on your limit switches, you don't have to do that because they should already be normally closed. But um, if you're getting continuity between them, that means the switch is working. If not, the switch is bad. And you shouldn't have to like jimmy the switch to do that, or play with it, or shake it, or press it hard. You should just press it, and if it works, it should work. If not, time to replace it. Like I said, you can just get your Dremel and grind off the rivets without having to undo that whole piece, and then put it back with some appropriate screws. You want to make sure that your screws aren't too big because you can't actually break the, uh, the plastic on your switch. I figured that out once the hard way. Well, I think that just about covers everything I have to talk about. Um, to quickly recap, you're going to want to start at your pilot light. If that's lighting, that's good. If not, you have a problem, try and get it lit. If not, it could be the gas valve. Once the pilot light is lit, check your voltage. If you're getting current, that means the thermal pile is working pilot light is working, but obviously a switch or something is bad. Check your switches, check your limit switches. If those are good, try the pressure switch. I would recommend starting at the pressure switch because that's usually what breaks first. Like I said, it's not the pressure switch assembly itself. Rarely it'll be this, there's something wrong with it. If you see that little piece sticking out, that means it's working. And it'll only be sticking out when water is flowing through the system. So make sure your pump is on. Um, Turn your pump off so that thing will retract. Test the switch. Attach your multimeter to it. Test for continuity. Press the switch. If it starts beeping, the switch is good. If nothing happens, the switch is bad. Same thing for your limit switches. If those are, if you're not getting continuity through, make sure they're not tripped. Like, uh, make sure you're not getting overheating or anything. Make sure they're cool to the touch. And uh, test them for continuity. If they're not conducting electricity through them, you got to replace them with that. Um, like I said, usually the pressure switch, but check everything just to be sure. Um, and once you've done all that, you should have rectified the problem. Now, that's the nice thing about these older analog -y type of heaters. If you have ones with the digital keypads and stuff, I mean, that could be a problem in the firmware or a number of other things. But I hope this video gives you a little bit of insight on how to troubleshoot and do some, what do you call it, I forget the word, diagnostics, diagnostics on your millivolt tool heater. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know or leave a comment.